and we're live. Hi, Meg. Hey, Nick. How's your night going? It's all right. Um, yeah. Wrapped up work not too long ago. Yeah, how's yours? It's good. I wanted to say you are my first woman guest on the podcast, so. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Trailblazing. <laughs> first of many, hopefully. Oh, yeah. I, th- I hope so, too. I, it's just funny. I, I started out with just my friends. And then I started, I went into like people that I know through like work and, you know, you're one of my, my best friends. So really nice to have you on, on the podcast. I know I've heard about it for so long. It's, it's <laughs> to uh, be a part of it. Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the things I wanted to say is that it's a podcast about motivation and like personal development. And one of the things I love about you is, um, is your intensity around running and your intensity with work. And your intensity, just like kind of with life in general, I think you're a perfect match for this. So I just wanted to ask you some questions about that. And if anyone ever wants to listen to you or me, they will have uh, 30 or 40 minutes here to do that. And they can hear all about how Meg views life. Is that okay? Perfect. Yeah, hopefully hopefully it's helpful. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. So you just finished your work day. Let's just, okay, 10,000 feet. Let's not go super deep yet. Uh, what were you doing today? Like what specifically, what kind of projects were you doing and, and what do you do for work? Yeah. So for work, um, I'm a software engineer, uh, full stack currently, and I work at um, a music startup that centers around royalties processing. Um, so my job um, today specifically, uh, Tuesdays are our like planning meeting day. So it was actually my meeting heavy day. I had three hours of meetings. Um video where we, we plan for the week and, and talk about the product um mm-hmm. and then uh, outside that i was coding so um working on uh back end in in python and django and uh, a little bit of front end for a, a drop down module <laughs> in typescript yeah that was that was my whole day <laughs> all right so what you just said i'm going to take all that i'm going to put them in keywords and i'll put them so we seo this thing okay so <laughs> people can learn how to do that stuff <laughs> pretty popular yeah they're it's it's good it gets get stuff done yeah for sure so on days like this i, I know when i have calls I'm, i work in sales if i have so many calls throughout the day but say i have to make a presentation or i have to prepare for a negotiation or i have to um put together like um just a like a a, a value prop when I have all these meetings, it's like, when do I actually do the real work, like internal meetings? So how do you view doing that stuff with what you do uh, and balancing how your brain works? So uh, specifically, do you find that you can get a lot of stuff done later uh, after the meetings or do you try to crank that stuff out in the morning? Uh, t- how do you how do you approach that? Yeah, meetings definitely take a lot of focus. And then especially when they're not back to back, when there's just like 15 or 30 minute gaps in between, it's a little tough to dive right into something. But um, one thing I do like about my company is I'm, I'm fully remote. I work from home, but it's based on the West Coast. And so uh, most of my teammates are two hours behind Chicago time. And so I generally get the most done in the mornings. As soon as I wake up, I make tea and work and um I will never have meetings before like 1130 Chicago time, which is pretty great. Hey, there's no, there's no um, shame in your schedule. When I was totally Pacific time, my boss was out there. I didn't have meetings until 10, but now I'm on Europe time. And uh, my boss is still in Scottsdale, but <laughs> a new boss is still in Scottsdale. But somehow he's up at six and I'm up at, you know, seven or eight. And uh, I'm starting. So, you know, I get I get done early, but I start early. So it's just how your your company is is scheduled, I think. Uh, yeah. When you said yeah. you said the thing about the tea, like, do you start you, you literally go to the, your uh, it might sound like why are you so interested in this? But I, I it's seriously like what is it about people and their motivation? Uh, some people drink coffee and they work. Some people like drink coffee and they meditate. Do you get your tea and then go straight to your computer and start like working? Or how do you start that that process? I think most days I do because I like to run when it's when it's peak out for winter running. So, I mean, today I was first day of spring, but Chicago dropped in weather. And so um, I don't really I'd rather run at 10 a.m. than 8 a.m. Um, so I figure if I'm going to take a big break to run, I'm going to start work and then work out. in the yeah. middle. But it, like Unless it. it's last year, right, when you're running in like five degree weather, 10 degree weather. <laughs> 
we can do it. We can do it. <laughs> oh, I, I'll ask you about that in a, in a few minutes here. But um, yeah, I just I kind of wanted to hear how you started your day and how you approached the meeting thing because some people they uh, they had to work in flow and other people they can kind of have their projects sporadically based throughout the day. I like that you sometimes have your phone on notifications silenced. Do you do that still or like almost every day? Or how, how often do you do that? It's automated um, for, for months now. It'll automatically go into a work mode, um, which means only Slack notifications and like calendar events. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps because my phone can be very distracting. Sometimes I'll even like leave it in my bedroom <laughs> because it's so uh -huh. easy to pick up. But... Yeah, there's a guy I love named Andrew Huberman, and he says for focus and and attention, the phone is almost like the worst possible thing. But all of us are glued to it, and he recommends if you're ever writing or like you do, if you're writing code or something, um, put the phone either in the drawer next to you or in the room. And he he's like, honestly, sometimes I've put it in the car outside because <laughs> it's so distracting. Um, I think I could be better at that myself because I I have it next to me all the time. But uh, I try to just like mute uh, a lot of group text or group or you know certain certain groups that are like constantly popping off, <laughs> <laughs> and that helps me. Uh, I think also having like expectations on people. It's like, hey, I'm not always going to get back to to you immediately. But I think mm -hmm. most people understand that you know if you're not gonna. Most people don't like text super asap. But I think expectations with with friends and even family is important. You know. Yeah, it's hard to change those expectations too if you want to switch up suddenly. But yeah, have you always been from home? I have been from home for the last four, just over four years. Before mm -hmm. that, I was five days in an office, and then yeah, COVID twenty twenty, um, several jobs since, one hundred percent remote. Same, yeah, same. It's so funny. I think that back in, back in those days, like when I was in the office too, like if someone texted me at nine, there's almost like an unspoken rule of like. Hey, he's at work. It's a Tuesday. But now those kind of barriers, I think people expect that they're gone. <laughs> you know, uh, if someone texts yeah. me at 8 or 9 p.m. and then I don't get back to them until the morning, I think that that's everyone kind of gets that. But uh, it's just so funny how there's like an accountability with the phone. Like if you're someone that has like different group friend groups, right? If you don't get back to people at all, it's like, oh, they're ignoring me. Right. And it's like, you don't want to do that if you truly value that person. Um, so it's just funny how there's like an expectation to that. It's where my mind's going right now. I don't, I'm not sure why, you know. Yeah. I mean, expectation around you to be on your phone while you're working from home and also to like maybe be a little more available work wise a little later because you are home in your office. Like I definitely sometimes work up until dinner or while I'm cooking dinner just because mm -hmm. my laptop's there. I can finish something if I want to. <laughs> uh-huh both ways <laughs> yeah yeah it's the the phone is uh it's a new thing i think covid is a, is a whole separate group of issues that <laughs> we've all had to deal with but uh one of the things i was going to ask you about is why'd you choose the line of work that you that you have i i'm a little intimidated by by what you do because i i sense that i wouldn't be very good at it but what made you want to go into that and how'd you know you'd be so good at it i bet you'd be good at it if you if you you okay. I, I probably could, but, but like anything we're all like, we've all been working now for what, 10 years. And we're all <laughs> years. Um, but so I majored in computer science in college, which naturally devolved to software engineering afterwards. But um, I didn't join college thinking I would major in computer science. Um, I always really loved math. I was like such a little nerd in third grade saying that math was my favorite subject. All this stuff. <laughs> um, it was. I don't know why. Um, so when I, uh, was picking colleges to apply to, um, one of them was Harvey Mudd College, which was, is a science and engineering school. It's very small, like just over 800 students total, um, and only like seven majors, um, or something. And so everybody that attends is forced to take a bunch of introductory classes and engineering and physics and chemistry, a bunch of math, and then we were forced to take an intro to CS, um, and I thought that was just going to be my intro. And then I move on to other things, but I just really, really liked it. Mm -hmm. Um, my college, the year that I entered was the first time the college freshman class was like just over 50% women, majority women. And, um, the computer science courses, like the structures did a really good job of separating like people who had already coded. Like I never 
coded before college. So they had different intro classes where you've coded before, like you've never coded before. And um, that made it like, you're just around people who are at a similar level. And yeah, mm -hmm. ever since been a long time. <laughs> yeah. I don't want this to be a job interview. Right. But <laughs> it's a funny question. Oh, I, done with those. <laughs> yeah, I think I've had, um, yeah, it's so funny. Right. Um, I've had a couple people on like artists. I've had some people on that do business. I've had some other salespeople on, and that's always an interesting question of like, what got you into, into the thing? Because mm -hmm. it, there are people, some people take like kind of wrapped around or like roundabout ways to get where they, where they are. But with computer science, I imagine what would be, um, really fulfilling is to know that there's a right answer to something. And if something is off in the code, you can, and there's like an error, you can like fix it. And it's like, Oh, I fixed that. Like to feel like you've done something that's like tangible like that would, would feel really good to me. Am I right or wrong on that? Yeah. The coding part is it's at the same time, like, yes, you have something that works completely, but on the other hand, if it's not working and you can't figure it out within a short time frame, it gets very frustrating because okay. you know you know the code's running correctly. You just did something wrong with it. So. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, this is really random, but I have a smart house with like a bunch of lights that turn off and on, and I can sometimes I can't figure out why certain lights won't turn on even when the <laughs> even when my phone is set up. So it goes from the the i the i the, the the HomePod, which is an Apple product. To these various different bridges. So one is like Philips Hue, which is the lights. One is like Power View, which is the blinds. And it's so frustrating to be like, this, it should, this should work, but it doesn't. Then I realize one little setting on my phone is off or, you know, I don't have notifications on or something. And it's like, I'm just trying to find common ground there of like, it's super frustrating. But sometimes when you get it, it's like, oh, all that time was worth it. <laughs> Not anywhere yeah. near the complexity of what you're doing. But uh, I, I I know what that feels like to finally get it. <laughs> when you it sometimes it it's the most simple mistake. That's why sometimes if I get so frustrated, I'll just like walk away for a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's oh, my God, I have just been loving running. And when I get caught up in like a sales situation, I, I get stressed throughout the day. Cause I want certain things to go my way. Okay. This relationship, we need to get this customer over the line with this process, or we need, I want this per person on my team to write the contract in a specific way. And they don't understand what, how I want it. Right. I go out and do like a two mile run and I come back and it's like, it's like solved naturally. I'm able to view it differently with clarity and I just write a quick email or I make a quick assumption and I, Oh, that, that works. And it, and it just kind of clicks. And I wanted to know if that if you have something similar with with running. I definitely do. There's on days where my schedule's pretty free and open. I don't have like hard meetings to be down for. Sometimes I'll decide to take a break and do my run or do my workout when I'm just at a point that I can't like turn the gears anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is because I'm not even thinking about it the whole time. It's just, I don't know if it's the blood flow, the energy or your yeah. brain, something subconsciously, but yeah, I think you almost one. have to not think about it. You almost have to move on to something different. I told you once I like to cook too. Like I'll cook and then I'll come back to it. Like after I make dinner and then I get it. It's like, Oh, that there's that thing I didn't think about before that is maybe like stopping this. So I think there's something about shifting like context between work and other things that really help you. Yeah. When you need a different perspective for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, When you think about running and like you did, so you tell me more about your, Tell the guests or the, the the audience about your your marathons. How many have you done? And you're you're missing one, right? Uh, I've done. I've completed six marathons on five courses, and they were all world majors. So I'm done five of the six world majors. One of which is Chicago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Congrats. so that's been over the past gosh eight years. I don't know how people do more than one a year. They're they're a lot. <laughs> yeah. So you're you're only missing what London. London. I keep trying London. to get her. And you said that was the hardest one, right? To get into? If you're not from the UK, yeah, that's just not quite as big as the others and everybody wants to do it. Well, mm. not everybody, but a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you get in. Is What's your plan to get in? I keep trying the lottery and then if, if that doesn't work, mm -hmm. eventually, you know, I'll start to get older and I'll be like, I need to get this done. They do like travel packages for guaranteed entries, stuff like mm -hmm. that. Good Pricey, but when I really want to do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't believe you went to Tokyo that like, was it this year or last year and ran that? That's just Absolutely. badass. Yeah. Super you, fun. You started with 
like 8Ks, 10Ks, or was it more like track? How'd you build up to, and I'm just curious at this point, I want to do the 26.2 at some point, but I, I'm a little intimidated. I'm wondering how I get my body right for that. And like, do I build up slowly? We talked about it on a Saturday, like I'm going to do a 10K, then hopefully 13.1. But how would you recommend considering all that? Yeah, I, so before I moved to Chicago, like I ran track, I did hurdles. My longest race was 400 meters. Um, I did cross country in high school, but that's no more than a 5K. So um, really what pushed me to it was there's not really any competitive track if you're not like an Olympian or anything. So mm -hmm. um, marathons were just kind of, a lot of my teammates moved from sprints to marathons. It's just kind of a new challenge and something that like you can really work up to and start having your own PRs again. Cause you know, you're not going to, I'm not going to PR again in the hundred hurdles, but uh -huh. yeah, it's just, and it's, I think it is intimidating when I first moved here and everyone's talking about marathons in my running group. I'm like, what are you talking about? I've never done half, but the fact that it's so intimidating is like, to me, what makes it such like, I don't know, such an accomplishment when you finally do it. And then you're like, Hey, maybe I'll do another one. Try to go a little faster. So yeah, I hope you, I hope you get to one soon. Yeah. So we have what we have four days until Sunday morning, which would be our, my first 8k. So it, it's exactly five miles about, right? Just under 4.97. So yeah. I'm pumped for that. And you said that when I get there, like when everyone's cheering, it's like this, it's, it's the biggest race in Chicago besides the marathon. Did I hear that right? I think that's true. It's 25, 30,000 people. It's a huge, huge race. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just ready to kind of like crush it when I get there, but I'm going to try to keep my pace down a little bit on that first mile. But um, I'm, Are you I'm gonna also, crush it? oh, thank you. I also wonder about the, the, the weather, like with it being so it's going to be a little cold that day. Do you think that that's going to affect performance at all for, for even you? It will. I can't remember where I heard this, but years ago, they, they did studies on what, is the ideal running temperature for a race for a marathon. And it's pretty low. I think it's in the 40s. So if obviously this isn't a marathon, but for distance running, cooler is better. I think it's mm -hmm. going to be maybe around like 30 degrees, but that's going to be way better for our times and a 70 degree day even. Oh, okay. So I, I would have thought that 60 or 70 was better, but you're saying that the heat may, might slow you down. Everyone's different, but I think generally a little cooler. So fingers crossed it stays dry. And then, yeah. Or I, warm up, so wear sweats to the start. I was going to say, now, what do I wear then? So 30 degrees, it's like sweatpants. Like, do I go shorts and hope I... <laughs> I think oh, naturally yeah. I'll just wear sweatpants and, you know, like a, a light hoodie. Um, So you can wear clothes to the start corral and then... Because you have to be there like 10, 15 minutes ahead of time. And then... Uh -huh right before the race what most people do is they kind of like uh take them off and throw them to the side they get donated so uh -huh. so i'll go buy like super cheap sweatpants or have an old pair and that way like your muscles stay warm for the start but you recommend having like shorts on under a on even even if it's like high 30s and going like you would not recommend wearing sweatpants for the race personal preference if it's high yeah. 30s i'm definitely wearing shorts but i'm also wearing gloves yeah i'm kind of like overthinking it I have these gloves right here and I've been wearing them. Even if it's 40, I'll wear these and they're super light, but there's something about that barrier with the wind that, that helps me a lot. I don't feel quite so uncomfortable. Yeah. It's hands that I feel like at the coldest. Mm -hmm. So tell me more about last, uh, last winter when you were do training for the, the, the marathon and like what kept you going on those super cold days? Oh yeah. Yeah. So the marathon was early March. So that means training all through the winter, but I, I don't mind the cold. Um, I don't know if it's from growing up in Pennsylvania and running in the winter there, but I don't get that crazy, like hard to breathe. Um, but one thing that was really helpful was I wasn't doing all of them alone. Uh, I was, I have this like big group of friends and we text and we haven't run in a while, but we'll do be like, Hey, who wants to run eight on Saturday? Or, Oh, you only run and run five. Like I'll meet you here. And, um, having people, especially on the most brutal mm. days, is really helpful. Yeah. I think you told me that once there's like a group that you run with. Is it once a week or twice a week starting in March? Is it? There's an official group, um, on Wednesday nights that goes March to November. Um, those are like speed workouts. And then we mm. just have like kind of a casual, casual run 
text chain, which you should start joining for your first Yeah, meeting. I'd love to. I'm <laughs> I'm like so into it right now. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Um, when it comes to speed, you brought me to East Bank Club and we did some of the stuff. We did some workouts up on the track and it was really just like timing. It sounded like it was just timing your, your lap and trying to get a, a few seconds better every, every time. If you have say four laps is, is there anything around running on the lake with that group or on streets that would be different than doing that? Just timing your, your certain distances like splits. Yeah. So for, oh gosh, there's so much running theory and all of it is just learned by people who've done this for, for way longer than me. Um, just, just tell me, yeah, <laughs> give, long give runs me your best. Weekend, generally they, they want to be like 60 to 90 seconds slower than your goal race pace. So they're not super challenging. You should be able to talk minus a couple times. Like I like to do kind of speed, speedier portions. So like one of the the toughest runs pre marathon was one I pulled from a, a previous run group I did from a coach, and it was like you're doing 20 miles, but your first seven miles are a warm up, and then you do like six miles at race pace, and then another two easy, and then you do another two like faster than race pace, and it's just like getting your legs used to like a quick pace when they're tired, and yeah, a long 20 miles. Mm -hmm. but yeah, that sounds long, but I can kind of see how once you get past the second six that are at race pace, then mm -hmm. it's it might be okay. I can see the finish line. It but kind of breaks it up. Yeah, at that point, you're like, "What's another two miles?" Totally. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been training pretty hard for the last point month, and I keep. I, I think I told you I keep my weights up. So I, I, if I was really serious, I probably wouldn't even lift weights. But uh, at least on my on my on my arms. But um. I noticed that when I started even getting up to like a certain pace that was that I was happy with was tough. But then once I hit this, this breaking point or like this plateau, I got past it and then I could start shaving more and more seconds off. And now I'm, I'm happy with where I am, but you know, not for my 10 K or 13.1 goals or I guess half goals. Um, but when you talk about like theory, I think you mentioned this idea of like tapering on the week before you, you race. So mm -hmm. can you just explain that one more time? Yeah. So generally in training, you want to go through cycles throughout the whole training thing. So like three weeks hard and then one week easy because your body needs some rest In marathon training. You'll do like increment your long run by a mile or two, and then you'll drop back. And so, um, the hardest one you do, like the hardest drop back you do is right before your race. And it's, it's kind of wild. Like when you're doing a whole marathon thing, you taper for two weeks, it's a little longer because you're, it's such a long race. Mm -hmm. Like it's like you kind of get like restless legs on the week leading up to the marathon. It's almost like a little bit harder to sleep. You're like eating less because you're running so much less compared to previous weeks. And mm -hmm. come race day, like if you do it right, it's just your legs are fresh and feeling good. And Yeah. 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 I, I, I've started to feel that like last week and the week before when I was running like every day or almost every day, probably I probably was overtraining, but that's what works for me. <laughs> um I was eating like a madman and I was working out. Like I just felt like I was just constantly sweating, you know, getting my clothes dirty, <laughs> doing laundry and then eating and eating and eating. Cause God, your body, I, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just like uh slamming food because I'm burning so many calories. You need to. <laughs> oh man. But uh, I just, like I told you about the, the stress besides the, the body benefits, the, the mental benefits like are just, I, I can't even explain it. I'm sure people, uh, have heard other runners talk about it, but uh, you know, if anyone out there wants to wants to try it out, just run for two weeks, you know, three days a week for two weeks, and I think you'll you'll have uh, the benefits after that at that time to continue with it. <laughs> but it helps to have a goal. I didn't realize having a race on the calendar was such a great, um, you know, it just creates structure. It, it creates a reason to get out there and continue working on my speed, working on my pace. Um, so I, I've really been enjoying training for, for the, uh, the shamrock shuffle and <laughs> a few days here. Yeah. I can't wait for Sunday, but yeah. And then, you know, you get one done, then you're like, what's next. <laughs> yeah. So I'm super pumped for that. And I'll, I'll ask you more questions on that after we get done with this one. Um, a few more questions here and then we'll kind of wrap up. Um, I asked you about running, I asked you about work, but I mean, you're always considering like music or you're, you know, uh, now you're doing lessons for what is it? Piano <laughs> on week three. Yep. I'm, I'm a true beginner. <laughs> and how did that, how did you, how did you start thinking about that? And what made you, uh, 
you know, pull the trigger on doing that. I I grew up playing oboe, but like piano has always like seemed like a cool thing I'd want to play someday. And I always said, oh, maybe I'll do it later. And after college, still haven't done it. And I decided I'd buy like a keyboard online um, thinking I'll try and teach myself and I have free time. And I've owned it for seven years, used it less than 10 times. So like it's, it was sitting behind my couch for probably two years straight untouched. Um, there's this um, Chicago I'd heard of people taking lessons here and there from this place called Old Town School Folk Music. And I I looked, they have adult piano lessons that run eight weeks once a week. And kind of like you talking about signing up for a race, it's like signing up for these lessons that are every Monday night. I, I need to practice. I don't want to show up and not be able to play what we're supposed to this week. And yeah. So yeah, very beginner, but uh, so far I'm really loving it. I show up, there's a chalkboard, like she's talking lessons, how to move your fingers. <laughs> when you're not in, when you're not in the lesson, do you dedicate time to practice on your keyboard or how do you focus on getting uh, good enough at that song for the, to, you know, perform the next week? Yeah. I um, kind of like a lot of things. Uh, it's a bad habit of mine as I wait I keep pushing it off. So it's typically <laughs> Sundays, um, which kind of works well. Uh, if it's a busy weekend, like Sunday evenings, um, just being like, oh, I have lessons tomorrow. I should definitely practice or, or Monday when I take some breaks. Mm -hmm. That's just so commendable. I think that you just bit it off. Like, Hey, I'm going to start doing this. And after eight weeks, uh, do you have a goal specifically around it or do you just want to get back into playing music? Um, one thing that's fun is uh, my instructor, she suggested we pick like a popular piece of music that's maybe a bit challenging based on her piano skill. Um, and we just work on that kind of on the side of our lessons. So so that's a good goal. And, you know, we'll see what happens. They they have piano three, four and so much more. So I don't know if it keeps going well, I'll keep doing it. Awesome. I'm glad you're enjoying that. And I always think about the person at the party who pulls out the they just sit at the piano and start playing like, you know, a song everyone knows. <laughs> So I think that's the song I would choose is the one that I like that I'd want to play for other people. <laughs> that's a little far away from me now, but hopefully one day, maybe okay. you, can, you, know, you can learn to, or you can sing along. And... <laughs> <laughs> I'll sing along. You, you gotta learn, you gotta learn some Pink Floyd and I'll sing along with that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, maybe I'll pick that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. So uh, I was going to ask you, everyone gets a special question, but uh, I try to make them a little funnier or a surprise um you told me <laughs> that you uh played oboe in, in grade school <laughs> tell me about the situation that got you to, to learn or to choose oboe among other other instruments <laughs> oh so lame um so uh, in third grade we can pick an instrument to start playing in fourth grade when we can join band and for some reason i wanted to play trombone i don't know my sister played french horn so we, and then said, I want to play trombone. They told me, Meg, your two arms, your arms are too short. You won't be able to hit all of the positions, which kind of... <laughs> I was really bummed about that. And then I was like, what's the hardest instrument to play? And uh, one of the responses was oboe to do the double read. Um, so I picked that one. Oh, man. I just Meg in grade school, just that thought cracks me up. Just oh, math gosh, nerd yeah. playing oboe. She was very cool. <laughs> Well, it's been so good getting to know you better. And um, man, I just I, this last couple of months hanging out with you running and just, uh, you know, all our friends here in Chicago, it's just great. So thanks for so okay. much for talking to me tonight and coming on and um, I thanks hope you have a good rest me. of the week. Love the shirt. It matches my artwork on the back wall here. <laughs> Appreciate it. That was one hell of a show. Lane 8, uh, 2021, was it? In, was uh, at Red Rocks. Great show. One of my top three ever, but uh, four hours straight. <laughs> Gosh. Cool. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. And thanks again. Bye. Bye.